this first session. So now, please stay with us. And now I turn over to our next speaker, Massimo Grilli, Emeritus Professor of Biblical Theology here at the Faculty of Theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University. Among his recent contribution, I mentioned a 2019 article, Come fare Theologia Biblica, um, he will talk at this morning on the title Exegesis Toward Theology. Um, I guess you will lecture in, in Italian or in English? In English. In English. Okay, thank you. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Biblical exegesis towards theology. The topic and the title I have been signed seeks to understand the so-called theological exegesis invoked by Benedict XVI in Apostolic Exhortation Verbum Domini. I will divide my paper into two parts. The first one of a more descriptive nature seeks to propose a status questionis on the relationship between the historical critical method and the canonical approach. In the recent decades. In the second part, more propositional offers an attempt to approach what is now defined from various quarters as theological exegesis. So, number one, historical critical method and canonical approach, status questionis. With the advent of postmodernity, a major change has taken place with respect to the certainties of the modern era, a structural and cultural change affecting society but also the anthropological and biblical theological outlook. The most apt metaphor to describe this change is perhaps the one we find at the conclusion of Umberto Eco's novel, The Name of the Rose, which came to light in the 1980s. The monk William and the novice Azzo after intrigues of various kinds, are finally about to uncover the mystery hidden in the monastery where they have been living from for some time, when suddenly the old monk Jorge starts a fire that no one will be able to tame and that we engulf the entire abbey in flames. Azzo and his master leave the monastery in the midst of a pile of rubble. The monastery, the symbol of ultimate metastorical and metaphysical truth, image of cultural and theological solidity crumbles. In the same years, in which Umberto Eco's novel came to light, the French philosopher Jean-François Lyotard, in his study on la condition postmoderne, describes the current era as a time characterized by the disappearance of metaphysical, ideological, and religious principles that had marked the modern era. Trust in the institutions and systems of thought of certain and unchallenged knowledge in the dogmatic immutable laws that govern states and churches is disappearing. Sigmund Bauman, to describe the philosophical culture cultural situation in which we are living, has coined an expression that has been successful in the scientific field, liquid society, a metaphor that presents our fragmented, 
and fluctuating world in opposition to the universally recognized value systems that characterized the 20th century research, which its ideologies, political parties, and inalienable moral principles, such as the historicism, Marxism, and so on. Biblical science is also involved in this loss of unity. There is no longer a single model of Bible, biblical science. The questioning of the historical critical method, which had dominated the landscape of biblical study for more than 100 years, belongs, at least in part, to this phenomenon of relativization and objective and unchallenged knowledge, which took place in the 1960s and 1970s. Along with this perception, there emerged an increasing awareness that the different methodologies uh, applied in Bible study used in a certain way lead to bracket the truth of God that the Bible intends to witness instead. The historical critical method and the critical literary methods can work just fine without the God hypothesis on playing solely on the factors that determine the story and the other simply highlighting the play within the text. It was at this juncture of mobility and crisis that uh, a movement was born and developed that attempted to find a mediation between the aridity of the purely historical critical method considered sterile for a life of believers and for the church, and fundamentalism, which irretrievably harms some ecclesial communities. Brever, Brever Child's proposal aims to combine critical study with theological engagement. Thus developed the current that would increasingly be identifi identified with the canonical approach to scripture. The advocates of this approach essentially accuse the historical critical method of failing to take the theological problem into account, privileging historical critical reasons at the expense of the canonical context, that is, at the expense of the authoritative force of the biblical texts, we are capable of expressing the faith and the ecclesial community and guiding its life. In the opinion of many supporters of the new approach, of this new approach, the historical critical method, with its attention to the empirical nature of the data, to the different levels existing behind the apparent unity of the test, to the other and the original recipients of the message, linked to a precise time and place of a composition, had distinguished itself from its origins as the guardian of the text and its historical meaning, but had forgotten that the historicity of experience of faith must, must not overshadow its being a testimony and the fact that this testimony was transmitted in a form that had become canonical. As a consequence, the canonical approach, unlike the historical critical method, focuses more on the final text, the sole vehicle 
of its author's testimony of faith, while the editorial stages forms of expressions and references to the cultural, philosophical, and historical context through which the testimony, testimony of faith is expressed becomes secondary. According to Child, therefore, the main question of the scriptures is primarily theological and must be addressed not through cultural historical analysis, but from the canonicity of the biblical text. Biblical theology as the canonical scripture of the Christian church as its proper context, not because this literature has influenced its history, but because of the peculiar reception of this corpus by a community of faith and concrete life. The Christian church has reacted to the literary by grasping it as the authoritative word of God and remains essentially committed to seeking its internal unity because of its own confession on the one gospel of Jesus Christ, which it proclaims to the world. It was a fatal methodological error, says a child, therefore, to choose the, to describe the Bible exclusively in categories of the history of religion, a choice that could only develop in the direction of contesting the integrity of the canon and denying the legitimacy of its content as uh, theology. The canonical view focuses, therefore, on the Bible as a testimony of the ulteriority of God, a testimony that can neither be stifled nor relativized. In this line of canonical approach and questioning of the historical critical method, Benedict the Sistine also sets himself in, in Jesus of Nazareth, affirming that if scientific biblical exegesis does not want to exhaust itself in ever new hypotheses and become theologically insignificant, it must take a methodologically new step and recognize itself once again as a theological discipline without renouncing its historical character. So far, the Benedict um, 16. I would like to conclude this first point by saying that the debate I have just referred highlights the two viewpoints that both come from Dei Verbum, which emphasized on the one hand that is God in sacred scripture who has spoken, and that Holy Scripture has therefore God as its author. And on the other hand, that God has spoken through men and in human manner, De Verbum 12, by choosing and using men in possession of their faculties and capacities, De Verbum 11, whereby the words of God have become like the speech of man, just as the word of the Eternal Father, having assumed the weakness of human nature, has become like man. The supporters of the canonical reading approach the issue from a confessional point of view, emphasizing the authoritative power of the biblical word and risking, this is Zenger's accusation to Childs, a certain canonical fundamentalism. On the other hand, the advocates of the historical critical method 
place emphasis on human mediation, risking, however, to confine the Bible to the sphere of historical experience developed over the centuries within well circumscribed geographical, cultural, and philosophical boundaries. Both perspectives highlight fundamental aspects of the problem, problem, which, however, if separated, risk losing sight of the whole. It is for this reason that Benedict de Sistine in Verbum Domini number 34, recalling the dogmatic constitution dei verbum, reiterates that only where the two methodological levels, the historical critical and the theological are observed, can one speak of a theological exegesis. I would thus seem that uh, the only adequate exegesis of the Bible is theological exegesis. But here is the problem. What does theological exegesis mean? And above all, how is it carried out on a factual operational level? That's it, that's it, that is to say, how can dialogue between exegesis and theology be made a supporting structure in biblical or theological studies? So the second point, theological exegesis, what does it mean? I would like to start from an observation by Paul Beauchamp made uh, some 20 years ago. Here are his words. It could be the exegete who does biblical theology or the theologian who takes possession of exegesis. It depends very much on people's temperament. But one can no longer say to someone, take note, check it, if the terms of the biblical assertion are correct, and then interpret it. This should no longer happen. It is still practiced, but among the younger generation, there is a very strong feeling that a biblical theology is necessary and that someone, exegete and theologian at the same time, should take care of this child if it is possible. I try to interpret Beauchamp's assertion. For too long, it has been thought that exegetes have the task of interpretation, while theologians have the task of taking in the results of the biblical scholars' research and building the theological system on them. This is not only not possible, it is deviant because reciprocity, or if you like, circularity, is a fundamental component of hermeneutics and concerns the exegete as much as the theologian. Theological exegesis presupposes at the same time an exegete who is also a theologian or a theologian who is also an exegete. A new status is needed in terms of dialogue between philosophers, exegetes, and theologians. If one individual could gather all these instances, it would be perfect. But in almost all cases, it's not possible. It is not possible. What is needed is for philosophers, theologians, and exegetes, instead of fighting each other by excluding their own discipline, to enter into dialogue. It seems to me that at present, the temptation to understand scripture purely on a historical critical level or according to a dogmatic model has been overcome. But 
I would also say that theology is still in search of a theory capable of asserting the theological quality of exegesis. There is a need for a more theological exegesis and a more exegetical theology, but at the level of praxis, we are still far from a convincing unitary model. The attempts made to date, including that of Ratzinger Benedict XVI in the work already mentioned, Jesus of Nazareth, are certainly supported by the legit legitimate claim to restore theological dignity to biblical research, to overcome the fragmentation and extreme opinability of much data coming from historical critical investigation, to return to considering the parts as element of a whole. But there is also the risk, we must recognize this, of resolving in an harmonious manner a series of tensions that are in any case within different writings and diverse on in time, tensions that constitute a richness for theology as well. A return to a traditional pre-critical ecclesiastical interpretation is a risk that should not be taken because it would be impoverishing for everyone. So how can exegesis be theological and theology still have an exegetical foundation? My conviction is that the methods and approaches to the biblical test will continue to be manifold and yet if one really wants to follow the path of theological exegesis advocated by verbum domini and let me say by the census fidelium it will be useful to reconfigure our minds according to a holistic vision that approaches the bible in its total reality, in its historical substratum, in its literary conformation, and in its pragmatic power to appeal to reader. I try, therefore, to formulate three hinges that underpin this perspective. A heuristic axis, a methodological axis, and a hermeneutic axis. These three axes are not exhaustive of this issue and should not be considered isolation, in isolation. They are interwined and must be woven, woven into a model to be formulated according to the needs demanded by the text itself and the creativity of the interpreter. First, the heuristic principles. The heuristic principle that directs biblical research, or we could say the pre-understanding of it, must be found in the fact that the Bible is a reality that inseparably links historical memory and charismatic proclamation. More precisely, more precisely, this means that the revelation of God and his mystery took place in a history and that this history became text. It is therefore a tested historical revelation that aims to introduce readers into the truth of God. This heuristic principle should never be forgotten because it is perceived Precisely it that founds the holistic theory of attested revelation and demands a new and complex approach to biblical reality, which is carried out in analyzing the texts as document of a history to be reconstructed through a critical approach, but always 
keeping in mind the ultimate goal that could be expressed with the conclusion of John 20:31. This was written so that you may believe and believing have life in his name. Second, at the methodological level, the holistic view of the Bible requires that the analysis holds together the word of history, history which the, the text narrates, the world of the text, and the world of the readers, the individual reader and the collective reader, with a procedure attentive to the unity of biblical revelation, the historical world, world, the literary world, and the world of readers are to be critically analyzed with the tools of the historical, literary, and communicative sciences. The document Verbum Domini, again, at number 24 states, on the one hand, the Council emphasizes the study of literary genres and contextualization as fundamental elements for grasping the meaning intended by the geographer. On the other hand, since scripture must be interpreted in the same spirit in which it was written, the dogmatic constitution indicates three basic criteria for taking into account the, the divine dimension of the Bible. First, interpreting the text by considering the unity of the whole scripture. This today is called canonical exegesis. Second, keeping in mind the living tradition of the whole church. And finally, third, observing the analogy of faith. This is the position of Verbum Domini. But the interpreting of the text, taking into account the unity of all scripture, perhaps requires clarification. Casper argued that the biblical witness resists systematic univocation. Both the First Testament and the New Testament present a variety of tradition, assemblages, literary forms, but also diverse and even contrasting theologies. In one and the same book or corpus, we find a multiplicity of voices that includes not only different documents, duplications, contradictions, but also polyphony of tones motives. If unity is to be taken into account, then it must emphasize that it's a complex unity, an organic and unsystematic unity. The task of the theological exegesis is not, re is not really to exhaust itself in understanding a particular voice or instance, nor is it to level out every tension. The task of theological exegesis is the intelligence of the whole, an organic intelligence that knows how to integrate the otherness of the parts into a complex and di dialogical unity. In this sense, the canonization of the polyphony of biblical voices is the canonization of intra-biblical dialogue about God's truth. And finally, at a hermeneutic level, it seems important to me to emphasize this principle. The different methodological procedures must be placed within an awareness that takes into account the entire hermeneutic process that requires, requires a peculiar vis-a-vis -vis between the world of the text and the world of the reader. 
it is no longer possible to consider these two worlds as extraneous. Interpretation, therefore, does not consist in the search of the objective or orig original meaning, meaning of the text, but rather in a fusion of horizons, Gadamer, whereby the individual and interpreting community finds, in se finds itself immersed in an event, the event the reading event, in which the reader's pre-understanding and the set of traditions experienced by the text intertwine and expand. Interpretation consists in the mediation of an event that modifies both the text and the reader. The text is never a neutral datum that the reader analyzes in a detached manner, but a place of exp experience. Likewise, the reader is not a closed subject, but occupies an intermediate position between familiarity and estraneousness with respect to the past from which the test comes. In the circular or dialogical model, receiving, decoding, and responding are part of a process that occurs simultaneously, so that the receiver is at the same time the sender, cooperating in the construction of the message. In other words, communication is not something that one does to the other, but a process that one does with the other. Conclusion. It seems to me that the situation in which we find ourselves today as exegetes and theologians is one in which uh, after the third quest, a fourth quest must open in which the various methodologies are better integrated into a holistic and eidetic reading of the scripture. And yet, ours is more a foundational than a content-based treatment. It is, as we have uh, good uh, recipes for preparing a great meal, but then the meal ready and served is missing from the table. Either the meal is lacking, lacking because every exegete and every scholar is himself called upon on the basis of the prescribed recipes to serve excellent starters and main courses, or the meal is lacking because quite simply these processes are long, complex, and bumpy. Whatever the solution, it is up to us not to be discouraged and not to give up. Thank you. <clears throat>